Hello, I'm Inash Ravinsky. Welcome on board the Eastern Express. And as always, I hope you enjoy the journey. Tonight we're diving into a story that feels like it's straight out of a choose-your-own-adventure book, except it's being lived out by an entire country. Yes, folks, we're talking about Armenia, a nation seemingly at geopolitical crossroads, making moves that would make even the most seasoned chess players' heads spin. From daringly opposing Russia through their new situationship with France, all the way to their EU aspirations, Armenia has been the most intriguing foreign policy show to watch in recent months. Let us take a look at our report to find out more. Despite saying it's ready for peace with Baku, Armenia still feels uneasy around its eastern neighbor. That's exactly why Yerevan is investing in new equipment fresh out French factories. Armenian and French defense ministers have said that Paris signed commitments to sell PGM precision rifles to Armenia. Aside arms deals, France has also promised to train Armenian soldiers and some non-commissioned officers at their world-famous St. Cyr Military Academy. Since Azerbaijan's lightning takeover of the Nagorno-Karabakh region in September of 2023, Armenia's trust in their historic partner, Russia, has been waning. Many Armenians believe that Moscow is to blame for Yerevan losing control of the mountainous region, as Putin did next to nothing to assist Armenia in its war with Baku. The seizure of Nagorno-Karabakh by Azerbaijan forced some 100,000 people to flee the region, and Yerevan is determined to prevent this sort of disaster from happening ever again. And now, as always, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. Let's begin with Armenia's recent shopping spree in France. And no, they weren't there for the baguettes of the berets. Armenia signed an arms contract with France, a move that raises eyebrows, in particular because it signals a shift in Armenia's traditional military alliances. Imagine walking into a party with a friend you've known for years, only to ditch them for someone you've just met because they have a cooler watch. That's Armenia and Russia right now, with France playing the role of the shiny new acquaintance. But wait, there is more. Apparently Armenia is willing to risk it all and break some decades-long ties. The Armenian Prime Minister, in a plot twist worthy of a soap opera, hinted at a future where Armenia might leave the Collective Security Treaty Organization, a military alliance with Russia. It's like one of those moments when someone says, we need to talk and you just know the relationship status is about to change. Armenia is flirting with the idea of it's not you, it's me, but with international alliances. And just when you thought Armenia's relationship status couldn't get more complicated, they're also making eyes at the European Union, expressing a desire to join at some point. It's like Armenia is updating its relationship status with Russia to it's complicated, while sending winky faces to the European Union. This move is akin to joining a new club at school because they have better snacks, or in this case potentially more supportive policies, for Armenia's future. In a move that feels like Armenia is trying to unfriend Russia on Facebook without causing too much drama, they're also asking the Russian Federal Security Service to pack up their bags and leave the Yerevan airport. It's the equivalent of changing your locks and hoping your ex-partner doesn't make a scene. This request is like saying, I think it's time you see other airports, but in the most diplomatic way possible, of course. Let's be clear, Armenia's pivot isn't just about buying fancy weapons or joining exclusive clubs. It's about a small country navigating the treacherous waters of international politics, seeking security, stability and perhaps a bit of respect on the global stage. It's a reminder that in the world of international relations sometimes you have to play the long game, make unexpected alliances and yes, occasionally ask someone to leave your airport. And now. We are joined by our guest today, Dr. Konrad Zastoft from the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Warsaw. Hello and welcome to Eastern Express. Hello, thank you for having me. So let us begin with Armenia potentially leaving the CSTO. Would you say that the CSTO, to paraphrase a very known quote concerning NATO, which obviously the author of the quote has since changed his opinion on that, but that's another matter, 
Would you say the CSTO is a bit brain dead today and might actually expire soon, given what's happening around it? Well, uh, uh, CSTO was uh, so collective uh, security treaty organization um, established by, by Russia and uh, joined by several uh, post-Soviet states. Um, it was always, um, its aim was to uh, become a kind of um, alternative to uh, to NATO, to Atlantic Alliance, but it was always something more like a parody of, of NATO. Uh, it, it doesn't function now. It, it has pro it had serious problems to do anything effective in the past, um, and obviously from the point of view of Armenia. Uh, CSTO was totally ineffective in a situation of uh, uh, armed conflict with uh, with um, Azerbaijan. So uh, we can fully understand the decision of uh, Yerevan to uh, to quit uh, CSTO. So how seriously would you say Russia is going to treat this? I mean, from our perspective, like you said, this organization looks a bit ridiculous, right? It's like an evil version of NATO. Except, of course, for Russia, it's probably deadly serious. Would you think that they will accept a country that has been around for a while to just say, no, we're leaving, goodbye, we're going our own ways? I mean, with Ukraine, when Ukraine wanted to join the European Union, I mean, we all remember the story, right? 2014, invasion, violence. And this is a story that continues until today. Do you think Armenia is treading on thin ice right now? It's all about the prestige of, of Moscow, uh, because uh, Armenia doesn't play any important uh, role in CSTO. Uh, so CSTO... Uh, doesn't help uh, Armenia, but also Armenia is uh, irrelevant for, for CSTO because, uh, uh, frankly speaking, CSTO is, is Russia and the other countries are, uh, other post-Soviet countries are much, much more, less, uh, um, uh, less important. Uh, so, uh, again, it's about uh, the prestige of Russia and in the situation, let's say, imagine before, mm -hmm. 2022, yes, Russia wouldn't agree for, for such a, a decision of Yerevan because uh, it strikes this prestige, uh, exactly. But uh, yeah. now in the situation when Russia is involved in war in Ukraine, uh, I can um, completely imagine that uh, that uh, Yerevan is quitting uh, uh, CSTO and, and uh, um, Russia uh, has to accept it somehow. Although I wouldn't say it, it will be a very a quick process. Uh, I think there will be uh, there will be some stages. So for first stage is maybe uh, getting rid of uh, Russian soldiers from uh, the main uh, Armenian airport, uh, Zvartnots uh, airport in uh, Yerevan. Then uh, we will see maybe uh, mm, Russian soldiers leaving the border with uh, with Turkey, and then the most most important uh, uh, thing is of course uh, uh, Russian military base in in Gyumri, the second biggest city of uh, of Armenia, and here it's actually a bigger problem because this is the the biggest military base of Russia mm, outside of its uh, borders. Uh, of course, I'm not uh, counting Ukraine now, but the uh, uh, biggest legal uh, military base is in, in Gyumri. So Russia probably would like to stay there, uh, but we'll see. I can imagine that the Russia will, uh, will agree to leave this uh, um, military base as well. Um, of course, we, we have to remember that uh, Russia needs these soldiers on, on the front in Ukraine, so maybe it will be even better for, for Russia to have these soldiers uh, elsewhere, I mean in Ukraine, than, uh, than in Armenia. So it looks like a difficult issue for Russia itself, uh, but also for Armenia. I mean, do you think that Armenia will be welcomed uh, 
with open arms by the likes of, for example, the European Union someday. We know that Europe also has a lot to gain from a partnership with Azerbaijan. So which of these two countries is likely to be more attractive? Uh, would it basically mean that if the West chooses Azerbaijan, Armenia might actually be left in a limbo, somewhere between Russia and the West, having no benefits of a close alliance and yet being in a precarious position vis-à-vis -vis Moscow, for example? European Union and European Union states and also um, the United States, uh, uh, all the Western countries uh, have to play a very delicate, delicate, uh, balanced, uh, to have very balanced approach uh, re <clears throat> relating those two countries, uh, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. I think both countries are important. Uh, mm, but because of different reasons, Azerbaijan, obviously, because it's an important uh, source of of, um, uh, of uh, gas alternative to Russian gas uh, for the uh, European Union uh, countries. Uh, in case of Armenia, uh, we see now that uh, uh, Armenia is an uh, example of uh, a country which which is. Uh, um, uh, in the process of a successful uh, democratization. So it's uh, in the past, uh, it used to be Georgia, which was seen as a, as a um, best example of, of democratization in the region. But now in Georgia, we see many problems with, with democracy. And now uh, it seems that, that Armenia is, is uh, um, uh, adopting these Western European standards uh, in the best uh, way. So, uh, of course, it's important for, for the European Union, for the European Union states to, to support uh, uh, Armenia on this way. But it's a distant prospect, isn't it? I mean, we know that Ukraine would really like to join the EU and it satisfies more of those criteria. There is also an underlying reason to expedite this process. We want Ukraine to be a part of the family of Western democratic nations a lot because of security concerns. Uh, then there is also the situation in the Balkans, the long waiting list, right? So. Do you think that it's a bit optimistic to think of Armenia joining the EU, given that countries which are much, much closer to actually passing the threshold are still waiting, and sometimes for quite a while? Yes, we can mention the example of, of Turkey, which is the, the country which waits so long for, for uh, any progress in, in uh, the succession process. but. Uh, uh, as I said, Armenia is uh, doing a lot uh, in, in terms of uh, transforming its political system towards this uh, uh, this uh, kind of political system which we accept in uh, in the European uh, Union. But of course, I, I, I'm not over optimistic about the, the timing because. Uh, First of all, uh, uh, Georgia, uh, Moldova, and uh, uh, Ukraine, they, they had since 2014 this uh, association agreement with the Euro European Union. So they are much more advanced in this process of integration with the European Union uh, in terms of economy as well and, and uh, adopting some uh, parts of uh, Aki Communautaire. Uh, which is not the case uh, uh, when we speak about uh, Armenia, which is still a part of uh, this uh, uh, Russian-dominated organization, such as CSTO, uh, in the military uh, terms. And, uh, uh, and there is Eurasian a military Economic base, right? Union. It's a thorny issue. Uh, you know, you have a military base there uh, with Ukraine or with Moldova. Naturally, we have another problem with Russia illegally occupying parts of territory. But for Armenia, you would essentially say, look, you're open to join, but you have a Russian base there. So what do you do about, say, the free movement of people, for example? Would members of Russian military personnel get the benefit of uh, potentially at some point, uh, you know, essentially moving freely as part of the Schengen zone? You know, it's, it's still a very distant concept, but it's actually difficult to imagine this at this point without like a revolutionary change, Russia abandoning that base or something of a similar kind. Yes, as I said, I'm not overly optimistic about timing. So uh, 
it, I cannot imagine, of course, uh, uh, Armenia entering uh, European Union with the Russian base uh, uh, inside. Yes, but everything may may change. This geopolitical situation is changing very fast. So uh, um, I can imagine that the Russian troops will uh, leave someday Armenia. And uh, uh, what I hear from uh, from Armenian politicians, I think it's their wish to to, to get rid of uh, um, uh, Russian soldiers. So that's that will also that should also include also the uh, Russian base in, in Gyumri. And of course, we need to take into account the political aspect. Nikol Pashinyan would really like to show some success, or at least the prospect of one to society, given that there is a lot of discontent over how the whole, um, you know, the whole Nagorno-Karabakh conflict actually went, ending in disarray for Armenia. Konrad Zastovt was our guest today here on TVP World. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your expertise. Thank you. And now we're moving on to Eastern News Flash, a curated selection of all the other stories from the East that you really don't want to miss. Ukraine could be receiving some much needed cash soon, as the European Union aims to unlock 3 billion euros from frozen Russian assets. The European Commission is preparing a proposal that would allow the funds to be given to Kiev as early as this July. As funding from Washington wavers under Republican pressure, the EU has decided to take helping Ukraine into its own hands. Hence the European Commission's efforts to speed up the process of granting Ukraine 97 percent of the net profits generated by all 190 billion euro worth of Russian assets. Originally intended to be spent on the reconstruction of the country after the war, the money is now planned to be used as funds for military aid to Kyiv in their ongoing fight against Russian aggression. While 3 billion might not seem like much in the grand scheme of things, EU officials say it's much more likely to be voted in at the upcoming EU leaders' summit, unlike the lump sum of frozen assets. Still, experts say next week's meeting is likely to see Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban oppose spending the money on weapons purchases. A recently published UNESCO report says that rebuilding Ukraine's dismantled science sector will cost upwards of 1.26 billion US dollars. The total price tag factors in destroyed buildings, equipment and the displacement of personnel. The report lists nearly 1,500 destroyed buildings belonging to over 100 scientific institutions alongside 750 pieces of state-of-the-art research equipment that were damaged, most beyond repair. This has led to truly staggering budget cuts as 450 institutions affiliated with the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine saw a decrease of nearly 50% of their combined budget. The study also shows that tons of vital equipment have been either stolen or destroyed at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, including a unique radiological laboratory that monitored radiation levels of the plant. As the war in Ukraine drags on, Moscow's pockets are growing lighter than usual. To counter the looming fiscal crisis, the Russian government is planning to raise both the personal income tax and the overall income tax. Feeding the ever-hungry Russian war machine is very costly, especially when the Kremlin also has to deal with mounting sanctions. The tax hikes will have the biggest impact on the middle and upper middle class. If the motion is passed, the Russian military budget will be bolstered with an additional 2.5 trillion rubles per year to spend on artillery, ammunition and anything else the top brass desires. The Kremlin is said to be gearing up to set aside around 14 trillion rubles for the military in 2024, or roughly 40% of the entire federal budget. Experts say that the move suggests that Moscow is preparing for a protracted war in Ukraine, a war that regular Russians will have to pay for in the long run. Scientists at the Tallinn University of Technology have found an antidote to the Russian nerve agent known as the Novichok. The chemical weapon is often associated with the murders of Russian opposition figures. Led by senior scientist Yevgen Karpichev, the Estonian researchers believe they have finally found a cure to the infamous nerve agent. Novichok poisoning is believed to have been the cause of death of Sergei Skirpal, former military intelligence officer turned UK double agent. Late anti-Kremlin opposition leader Alexei Navalny has also been a target of a Novichok attack. The compound causes partial blindness and nausea, and in higher doses, muscle spasms, respiratory problems and damage to the nervous system. The cure is also reportedly capable of counteracting the effects of other powerful synthetic agents, making it the ultimate shield against Russian assassination attempts. 
For this episode of Eastern Express, it's the end of the line. But please stay with us here on TDP World as we bring you more latest news and updates. I'm Jana Sherevinski. Bye for now.